Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. As you can see uh, on my website I did quite a few videos uh, going over Eagle, uh, how to use Eagle and especially how to create library parts which uh, for me was the most confusing part starting out. If you're interested to see any more Eagle videos uh, please let me know either in the comments on YouTube or uh, in the comments on my website eapbg.com. So today, to change gears from Eagle, I want to talk about finite state machines. The reason I want to do this is I find that it's very difficult for a beginner to grasp what a finite state machine is and how to use one. I personally blame this on the uh, beginning Arduino sketch blink because it uses delays and for a beginner the the process of using a delay is very easy to grasp you know you execute action A delay for X amount of time execute function B delay X amount of time repeat and for a beginner it's very easy to grasp but delays are bad delays are terrible because if you're in a delay you're stuck until that delay runs out there's absolutely nothing you can do so one way to overcome something like that is to use a finite state machine and there's a disclaimer here and that is finite state machines are very complicated or they can be meaning that uh, there's a lot to them there's more machines there's mealy machines uh, there's different ways of drawing the state diagrams for finite state machines and that all of that is outside the scope of what I'm here uh, to talk to you about right now and what I'm uh, I'm going to use a a, a three-tiered approach to talk to you about state machines this is just going to be an introduction for beginners so the first thing is to understand what a state machine is and the general idea of how things work in the state machine. The second is I'm going to use the state machine of a real life example and this right here is a RoboFet and I'm going to use him as my example and finally I'm going to show you how to actually write a state machine in code because that might be the most difficult part to grasp on how you actually get a state machine to work in a program that you wrote. So the question is what is a state machine or a finite state machine? What it is is a way to look at a series of events and how they're all linked together. So here is a very very basic example of a finite state machine and this is how uh, your normal day might go about. So you wake up, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed, you sleep, you wake up, you work, you go to bed. This is a uh, representation of a basic flow of a finite state machine. The reason why it's called a finite state machine is because you have a finite number of states. You There are no wild cards. There are no things that happen spontaneously. In this case, you have five states, and the arrows show you how you transition between those states. So I said this is just a very basic idea of one. So now let's make it a little more complicated. So this right here is a slightly more complicated version of the same state machine because you wouldn't just go to work and come home every single day of the week because there are weekends so when you wake up you have to make the decision is this a weekday and I'm gonna go to work or is this a weekend and I'm gonna do other things so I wake up I make the decision is this a weekend yes it is so I'm gonna mow the lawn I'm gonna watch the game I'm gonna make dinner and then I'm gonna go to bed and then after I wake up, I can make, again, the decision. Well, let's say the first time through was a Saturday. The second, you would come over here again because now it's a Sunday. You go through again, now it's Monday, and you go through this way. So 
this is the basic layout of a state machine. There are basically two different ways to transition around a state machine. The first is the most obvious, and that's time. So you sleep until, let's say, 6 a.m. when you have to wake up, and that's when you wake up. It's a time, very basic. But that, again, I want to reiterate this, is that delay, this is not using delays. This is using time. Uh, the second one is event-based. Something triggers you to move from state to state. So time triggers you to wake up. Once you're awake, now the event is what day of the week is it? So if it's a weekday, you would go to work, and if it's a, a weekend, you mow the lawn. So let's say it's a weekend, the event is weekend, and you go to mow the lawn. Mowing the lawn is... Uh, the transition out of mowing the lawn is event-based because you're not going to mow the lawn for an hour and then stop. you got to finish mowing the lawn. So the event that transition you out of mowing the lawn is not time. So once you transition from mowing the lawn to watching the game, now this is where it gets interesting because the trigger to move out of watch game is mixed. It can be either time or or it can be an event. For example, let's say you're watching the game and the game is scheduled to end at 6 o'clock, but the game goes into overtime. So when you get to 6 o'clock, the time, you have to check to see is the game over yet. And now that becomes the event that, well, if the game is over, go ahead and transition to making dinner. But if the game isn't over yet, you have to stay in the state of watching a game to finish watching it, and then the transition becomes event-based because you transition when the game is over. A few more things to mention about state machines. Uh, one thing is that you can have a state machine inside of another state machine. For example, uh, from our previous example, we had the work state. Well, you can have a second state machine inside the work state that while you're at work you can make you can be making calls you can be checking your email or you can be uh, in a meeting and every single state in the state machine can have different I like to call them sub states but that's my own personal preference but then when you're in the state, you then use the substate to figure out what you need to do so what am I doing and the substate lets you transition between the states while you're in the main state. Another thing about state machines is that you are not just limited to a single state machine. You can have multiple concurrent state machines. So the example I showed previously, you had only a single state machine and you would transition throughout it. This is just a, a very super generic example of having two uh, concurrent state machines. So both of these state machines are running at the same time. And you might ask how that uh, works. So let me explain. So let's say when the program starts, you start out with state A. In state A, you check to see if the conditions are met for transitioning from state A to state B. And let's say they're not. Because the conditions aren't met, you know that you're guaranteed to stay in state A for at least some amount of time until the conditions are met. So what you do is you break out of the, uh, the ABCD state machine and then you enter the XYZ state machine. So you go into X and you check the, the conditions uh, are met to transition out of state X. Let's also say that they're not you know that you're not going to transition to any of the other states, so then you go back to the ABCD state machine, and again, you check to see if the conditions are met to transition from state A. Let's say enough time has gone by while I was checking X that it's time to transition from A to B. So the transition happens, you go from A to B. Now that you're in B, you fulfill anything that you needed to do, and you check to see if you need to transition out of B. 
let's say you don't, not enough time has gone by, you come back over here. You Now you're back in state X. You check state X, and let's say state X is event-driven, and something in A tr can, uh, triggered the event to transition from X to Y. So then you transition from X to Y. And uh, this basically keeps going. And I will show you in more detail here in a second how you would actually implement this in code. And the way I'm going to uh, demonstrate this is with the example of RoboFed I mentioned previously. So this is RoboFed. Uh, RoboFed is a 3 kilogram sumo wrestling robot. And if you're not familiar with the event, it's you place two robots into a circular arena and they try to push each other uh, out of the arena. The first one that crosses the line loses. RoboFet was built for the 2013 National Robotics Challenge, which it uh, won. Also, uh, RoboFet went to California for Robo Games, uh, in which it placed fourth. So, RoboFet uses ultrasonic sensors. There are two of them in the front. You can see them here. And then there's one on each one of the other sides. Uh, RoboFet is, the brains of RoboFet are powered by an Arduino, and it's hidden right here underneath the uh, sensor shield. And then the motor drive for Arduino is this uh, Dimension Engineering. Um, the name eludes me at the moment. I'll, I'll have to, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to do a, a full write-up on uh, RoboFet at a later point in time and really go into detail about how it's built and how it works, etc. So uh, stay tuned for that. So RoboFet works you by using a state machine. So the way the state machine works is that first, when the program executes, RoboFet checks to see if something is sitting in front. If something is sitting in front, RoboFet will drive forward and then continue ch to check the fronts. If something is in front, it'll continue to drive forward. If something is in front, it'll continue to drive forward. So that's two states. That's check sensor, check front sensors, and then drive forward. So the advantage of that state machine is that you're never tasked with checking the side or the back sensors. because uh, ultrasonic sensors take a little bit of time to sample to be able to uh, get a reading off of them. So what happens if something is in front? So when RoboFet checks to see if something is in front and there isn't, the next thing it goes into is it checks the sides. If there's something, if a if an object is found to be to the side or to the back of RoboFet, RoboFet will rotate to face that to, to face the opponent, and then it'll go back to the something is in front, drive forward state. So let's see what this looks like in a diagram. So this is a basic state diagram for RoboFit. So first it checks to see if there's something in front. If there is, it'll drive forward. After it initiates the drive forward, it'll go back and check the fronts again. If something is still in front of it, it'll keep driving forward at it. So it goes back and checks to see if something's in front. Let's say there isn't. Now it'll drop down here and it'll check the sides and the back. If it finds something, it'll turn to face it, and that depends on whether it was to the left, to the right, or behind it. And after it turns to face it, it drops back in to check front, and then it goes back to driving forward. I said the this is a very simplified diagram of what RoboFet actually does, uh, you know, underneath. And I will uh, post the software that I use for RoboFet. And please forgive me, but that was one of my very first software projects. RoboFet is how I learned to code. You know, I'm uh, self-taught as far as coding goes, and the code is kind of rough. Uh, it's reasonably well documented, but like I said, I'm sorry if uh, something doesn't make sense to you, but I will post the code. So what are some other things that RoboFet does it, that are not in, these, in this diagram? So let's say that after RoboFet checks the sides and the back, 
it doesn't find anything. So it still can't see anything. So from here, Robofat will go into the a turning routine, but then while it's turning, it will check the fronts, the sides, and the back at the same time. So as it's rotating, it, it's checking all of its sensors, and that's to make sure that it does it didn't miss something in its blind spot. Because if you look at him, you have a sensor facing this way, and you have a sensor facing this way. So right here, there is a blind spot. So if when RoboFed starts turning, you uh, completely sweep all the way a full 360 around RoboFed to find anything that's around him. Other things that he does is that if he senses, uh, let's say he went into the check the fronts and the si I'm sorry check the sides and the back state, and then it finds something on the right. Robofet will choose to turn right to face it, or if it finds something on the left, it'll choose to face to turn left. If it finds something in the back, it's the same amount of time to turn in either direction. So I, I believe it turns left, but don't quote me on that. It's been a long time since I've actually gone through and looked into my own code. Other things that Robofet does is instead of using some sort of timing or delay to uh, perform the turn, what RoboFed does is let's say it uh, saw something on the right hand side. So as RoboFed starts turning, it'll actually start using the right front sensor here to detect the object as it, uh, you're turning. And this is uh, to make it more foolproof. So, for example, let's say if my uh, if I had used the delay, which, uh, which again are bad, as Robofet uh, would turn, it actually the, the how far he turned actually really dependent on the state of the charge of main battery pack, the kind of surface he was on, uh, etc. But because I'm using the right front sensor as the event to finish my rotation and go back to just checking the front and driving forward it really makes it uh, it really takes the guesswork out of well did I as I rotated did I face my opponent another thing that Robofet does is the front sensors uh, essentially see in stereo so as if the enemy was off to the side this sensor would see it closer than this sensor so the the logic is as you drive forward and I uh, slow down a one motor and speed up the other one by just a little bit to kind of be able to track uh, my enemy if my enemy is trying to escape, you know, to the side from me. And that goes back to the state machine within the state machine. So in the drive forward state, I have three substates, which is turn slightly to the left as you drive forward, turn slightly to the right as you drive forward, or drive straight. So the question becomes, how do you actually implement one of these state machine? And let's take a look at some uh, pseudocode. It's very difficult to discuss exact code snippets, but uh, some pseudocode should work for us splendidly. So one way to write a state machine, and this is not the recommended way to do it, is by using whiles. So when you enter your main loop, you have a set of uh, while statements all in a row. So you enter while statement number one, and you check to see if you're in state one. If you are, go ahead, execute action one, then execute check one, and then start over. So the idea is action one is the action that you need to perform while in state one. Check one is the check you need to perform to see if you need to exit state one. So if you enter check one and check one says, okay, it's time to exit, in check one, you change your state variable to two. So whenever you come back around and re-enter the beginning of the while, this is no longer true. So you would exit this while and you would enter the second while. So when you enter the second while, 
the state is now equal to 2 because we changed it with check 1. And it's a similar kind of idea. You perform action 2. It's whatever you need to perform in state 2. And then you perform check 2. Well, do I need to exit the state and go back to state 1? This is just a very basic two-state uh, state machine. So you check to see, if, do I need to exit state 2? And then if you do, you change the state back to 1, and you come, because this is, is sitting in the main loop, you then go all the way back to the beginning. This is very simple to implement, but it has some major downsides. The first is the while loop traps you inside the loop. So as long as you're in state 1, you will never exit this while loop. The, and that's a really big disadvantage because let's say you want to have uh, two concurrent state machine, one that's governing something, you know, uh, one that's governing uh, things A, and then you need a second one that's governing things B. Well, that's very, very difficult to implement with while loops because you run into needing break uh, to uh, jump out of a while loop, and then you can actually accidentally trap yourself back into the while loop. So let's take a look at a, a more effective way of implementing a state machine. One uh, accepted way to... Uh, create a state machine is using if statements. The, the state machine is set up just like the other one, but the main difference is after you, you enter the state, so if state equals one, go ahead and enter this particular state, you perform action one, you perform a check one, and if you still need to stay in the state, because you used an else if to string these two if statements together, when you exit the first if statement, you actually exit down here. And since this is sitting in your main loop, once you exit, you actually jump back to the beginning, and then you check this again. And this action repeats over and over and over again. What makes this beneficial is that, let's say you had two state machines that are running concurrently. So you can place your second state machine with if other state equals to one down here. So after you check state one for this state machine, you can then go ahead and service your second state machine. Also what makes this beneficial is that you can have uh, multiple uh, sub-state machines nested within the state machine. So then after you check state 1, down here you can have another if statement that checks uh, state, uh, the sub-state. So if the sub-state is also 1, then you surface sub-state 1, and once the sub-state is serviced, uh, you jump out of it here and then work all the way around. Uh, if you're not aware this if, else if, else if, else if uh, kind of statement is uh, also very similar to a uh, case statement. So in a case statement, you hand the case uh, a variable, and then the uh, case will go through and check to see which case you're in. So another way to rewrite this is using the case statement. So that finishes up the basic introduction to a state machine. So uh, there, the topic has a lot more to discuss. The, as I mentioned earlier, there's more machines, there's Mila machines, there's different ways to do this, but this is just the basic introduction. So if you have any questions, uh, please comment either on YouTube uh, in the comments down below or on my website, eapbg.com. Also, uh, go ahead and comment uh, uh, on the website. Uh, and uh, like I said previously, I will post the code of RoboFat uh, as well. Uh, thank you for watching.